Michael feels Willow focuses him and makes him realize what matters in life, and it seems Chase does that for Brooklyn. Chase wonders what Brooklyn does for him. Michael says only he can answer that. Chase eventually has to get up to Brooklyn, and Michael says for what it's worth, he thinks Chase would be a great dad. Liz finds Finn in the break room practicing backgammon for his next match against Tracy. She offers to play with him, and he tells her about the history of the game and famous players. When Liz begins to win, she thinks she likes this game. Finn asks how she feels as this is her last day being just Nurse Baldwin. Liz reflects that she's been linked to this place her entire life through her grandfather Hardy. And this place has been where she's experienced so many highs and lows in her life. She wonders if she's strong enough to stand up there with like likes of Jesse Brewer, Bobby, and Epiphany. Finn says she may be the strongest of them all. He thinks it's time for a Hardy to be in charge again. Finn apologizes for not being able to join Liz's girls' celebration last night, but he felt she needed time with her best friends. She'd like to think he's one of them, and he says, no doubt. Liz says she has to get back to work so the new head nurse doesn't breathe down her neck. She wishes him a good night and heads out. Finn smiles and thinks the tide is definitely turning. In Ned's room, Olivia tells Tracy and Brooklyn that TJ is about to bring Ned out of his twilight sleep. TJ says they are optimistic about his recovery, and after they wake him up they'll evaluate his cognitive state. TJ removes the IV, and everyone waits for Ned to wake up. As Tracy notes how this is taking too long, Olivia asks if she's unable to keep from complaining in her son's ICU room. Tracy says, Ned is used to this. It's just like home. Suddenly, Ned stirs awake and asks for water. TJ welcomes him back and asks if he knows why he's in the hospital. Ned says his head hurts, and TJ explains he had an injury. Ned thinks he fell, and Tracy confirms he did. She asks what got him so fired up, as he ran out to the pool, as if he had earth-shattering news for Drew. Ned says it's all fuzzy. TJ asks in the year and what city they are in, and Ned is able to answer both. When TJ says, you'll just find Ned, Ned responds, my name isn't Ned, it's Eddie Main. Ned wakes up and delivers news to his family that leaves them speechless. Hello everyone, welcome to back my channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before starting the video, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Diane and Alexis meet at the coffee house and chat about Holly leaving town, leaving Robert free to pursue Diane. Diane doesn't know if she and Robert are compatible, given he has issues with her representing Sonny. That brings Diane to a case she's consulting on and needs Alex's advice. She details the case about a cryptocurrency company theft, and Alexis gives her some strategic ideas. Diane can see how much Alexis misses being a lawyer, and Alexis admits she does. She knows it's who she is. She misses fighting for just instead of standing on the sidelines and watching. Diane says, like a reporter? Alexis notes the dig Diane took at her job, but admits she does complain about it a lot and wishes she felt more fulfilled at the invader. Their discussion turns to Esm working there, which Alexis points out was a favor to Laura, and that Gregory accepted her offer to sit on the editorial board. They make plans to get together again soon, with Diane threatening to tape Alexis to her trapeze class. At the quarter main stables, Cody calls Sam asking for help with his case. Sam soon arrives, and he tells he needs her help bringing Gladys down, as she's the only one who knows the whole story and believes him. She says he never told her the whole story, pointing out he's left out why Gladys wants to frame him. He again can't explain, but says he must prove to Sasha that Gladys can't be trusted. Cody relays that he's hired Scott as a lawyer, but so far there is no footage from the nurse's ball to show Gladys went through his pockets and framed him. Sam thinks there are other ways to find the evidence they need. She calls Spinelli with a job offer, and Cody rolls his eyes. At the hospital, Sasha visits Willow Willow, can see Sasha has been crying, and asks what is going on. Sasha admits it's Nina. Willow thinks Nina did something to her, 
but Sasha says these are tears of joy. She explains Nana just wrote her the most wonderful letter of recommendation for her emancipation. Willow knows she's survived a lot this past year. Sasha says it was only because of the love and support of her friends, and Nina was a big part of that. Sasha brings up her own history with Nina, but Willow stops her. Willow knows what she's doing, but says Nina has put her and her family through the ringer, and some things can't be forgiven. Sasha knows they both have a history with Nina, but notes what she and Valentin did to Nina was horrible. And in the end, Nina still forgave them both. She's been lucky because Brando also forgave her for the problems her addiction caused. And recently, she wrongfully accused a friend of something, and though he's forgiven her, he's not sure he can be her friend again. Sasha reads a bit of Nina's letter about her to Willow, and says Nina's capacity for forgiveness is massive. She thinks it might be hereditary. Willow asks if she thinks she's been too hard on Nina. Sasha says it's never too late for a new beginning. Willow says she did tell Wiley everyone deserves a second chance. Sasha thinks about Cody and tells her that Wiley has a wise mommy. In the hall, Chase runs into Michael and learns Sasha is visiting with Willow. Chase tells Michael everyone is on the 10th floor awaiting word on Ned, and he's trying to avoid. Michael knows, Tracy. Chase asks Michael how he's holding up. Michael says they are slowly getting to the other side of all this. However, he hates the moments Willow is missing at home with the kids, including experiencing Amelia's first smile. He's been recording everything, but it's not the same. Michael admits beside all the angst and craziness, he wouldn't trade being a father for anything. He asks Chase if he ever thinks about children. Chase loves kids, and he and Brooke Lynn are back together. But having kids is a long way off. Michael warns him the future has a habit of catching up to you, sooner than you think. General Hospital's blast from the past could change Ned's future forever. Please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. When General Hospital had Ned fall into the pool seconds before he could rock Nana's world by revealing her big secret, we knew there'd be more to the story. Might, we wondered, the show actually kill Ned off despite having gotten nothing but grief over past Quartermain family deaths. More likely, we assumed, was Ned waking up with amnesia, unable to recall his name, let alone the fact that Nina was the person who'd call the SEC on Carly and Drew. But what we definitely never imagined was that after a few days in the hospital, Ned would wake up and think himself to be Eddie Main. Who? Newer viewers might be asking, which is a little bit sad because it means they don't know about one of the most wonderful love stories to ever unfold in Port Charles and Brooklyn, New York. But we'll do our best to give you the Reader's Digest version of the tale. See, it all began when Ned, not exactly thrilled with his life as an ELQ exec, got into his head that what he really wanted to be was a rock star. It was while performing under the pseudonym Eddie Main that he would cross paths with a woman who changed his life. Lois Cirillo. And while sparks immediately flew between the pair, there was one very big problem. Even as Eddie was falling for Lois, and vice versa, Ned, who at that time was using his dad's surname, Ashton, was involved with scheme queen Catherine Bell. Eddie married his lady love Lois, while Ned also tied the knot. Although his union with Catherine was born not of romance but blackmail, Things came to a particularly nasty, although fun for the audience, as the clip below proves. Head when during Catherine's birthday party, Lois popped out of the cake and declared, Happy birthday to Mrs. Ned Ashton. From me, the other Mrs. Ned Ashton. Despite this rather heartbreaking turn of events, Ned and Lois eventually found their way back together, bringing into the world their beautiful daughter, Brooklyn. Things went south again, however, when he struggled to choose between business and family. Ultimately, despite several attempts over the years, Ned and her Eddie realized that sometimes, being from two different worlds isn't nearly as romantic as it's made out to be. But with Eddie having now resurfaced, will Ned's heart still belong to current wife Olivia? Or might he be drawn back to Lois? 
As General Hospital's Drew is sent away, Cameron Matheson cries, It's outrageous. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before starting the video, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Drew is facing the music for his and Carly's SEC violations this week on General Hospital, and his fate has Cameron Matheson singing Say It Ain't So all the way to the slammer. It's been clear to viewers for a while that Carly was never going to go down for their shady insider trading, especially as Drew started making noises about taking the fall and leaving daughter scout to Sam and would-be stepdad Don's care. And right around Father's Day too. Wow. So Drew's the one in for a big surprise when the cushy plea deal he and Zeke worked out falls through. And the sword he throws himself on for Carly turns out to be mighty sharp. The judge decides to make an example out of Drew. Even though he's a war hero. Even though he's an ex-Navy SEAL. Cameron Matheson tells Soap Opera Digest. The nerve. Clearly war heroes should get to do all the insider trading they want without harsh consequences. Not only does he get two years in prison instead of six months, but they're sending him to Pentonville instead of the nice, friendly, local prison, Spring Ridge, the Moans Matheson. Drew is shocked that his stellar service record actually worked against him instead of in his favor. It's just so outrageous, says Matheson. The judge considers Drew to basically be a living lethal weapon and thinks that he isn't a good fit for Spring Ridge. So instead of casually consorting with the likes of former cult members and curiously quiet serial killers, it's off to the big house where the real criminals go. No leniency. It is what it is, sighs the actor. Carly being Carly. She's of course not as resigned to Drew's sentence. When she pops off in the courtroom, her boyfriend and partner in white-collar crime's goal becomes, let's make sure Carly isn't charged with contempt. It would sort of defeat the purpose of him taking all the blame, wouldn't it? Because, explains Matheson, the bottom line is, it's too late. But what we really want to know is this. Will we see much of Drew after he's packed off to Pentonville? And will he see some of its most illustrious guests? Paging Cyrus Renault and Johnny Zakara. Is Blackie Parish there? He can come too. General Hospital's cutest star gets cut before the show's fan convention. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before starting the video, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Viewers are always talking about how General Hospital needs to trim its cast, and that advice got taken to heart ahead of the show's official fan convention the weekend of June 9, as the adorable boys who play baby Ace Cassadang got their first haircuts. Mon Lana Clay posted the most precious video of scene stealers Jay and Joey getting their wispy locks snipped. They sported tiny barber capes and enjoyed driving in their little race car seats, like miniature Mario Andretis. Why don't adults get salon chairs like that? We're jealous? Hilariously, one fan on Twitter insisted that first child is not ace, and Clay had to assure them, my sons share the role. They're twins. Baby Ace got his first haircut for all his fans, the proud mama tweeted. And we are wishing everyone a fantastic time at the. If that isn't heart tugging enough by itself, Clay's video of the momentous occasion over on Instagram was set to never grow up by Taylor Swift. Yes, I may have teared up. More than once. Before we know it, Baby Ace will grow up. But until then, we'll enjoy cutie patooties Jay and Joey and their stylin' new dolls. Read more about the Claybee's cuteness with General Hospital co-stars Nicholas Alexander Chavez and Tabiana Ali. Zeke discovers Jordan's connection to Curtis and Portia. Plus, Carly refuses to let Drew sacrifice himself for her. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before starting the video, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. At the Metro Court Pool, Spencer arrives at Curtis' party and brings a gift. Curtis gives him a look but accepts the gift. It's a limited edition portrait of the original Savoy in Harlem, signed by the artist. Marshall and Trina gush over it. Spencer says it's a thank you for saving him and his brother in Greenland. Curtis says no thanks necessary, as he helped out with Trina. 
Trinan and Spencer go to sit at a table, and she tells him that his gift was thoughtful. She has a request for him and asks if he can switch the pool's boring playlist. In the restaurant, Korshia asks Zeke how Marcus seemed and who was with him. Jordan steps off the elevator, and Zeke tells his sister that Jordan was with Marcus. Korshia is surprised he knows Jordan. Jordan walks over, and Zeke says he was telling Portia that he saw her with Marcus earlier. Jordan explains he was a bit unwell, but it's nothing to worry about. Portia thanks her for taking care of him and then asks how they know each other. Zeke says he met Jordan at the pool the other night when his sister stood him up for dinner. Spencer interrupts briefly on his music-changing mission, says hello to the trio, and says he'll see them outside. He leaves and Portia fumes that of course Trina invited Spencer to the party. Jordan asks, party? Portia says Stella organizes a get-together for Curtis' birthday, and she's welcome to join them. Portia excuses herself, and Zeke asks Jordan if she has something to tell him. She says she's the police commissioner, which is how she knows Portia. He is more interested in her last name. She admits she's Curtis' ex-wife. Zeke puts it all together, and Jordan tells Zeke that Portia doesn't need to know about the kiss between her and Curtis, as that is over and done with. Zeke notes Jordan didn't seem surprised by who he was. She admits she found out he was Portia's brother last night when she saw him with her, and that's why she wanted to talk today. She realizes this is too messy to continue to become more than it was, and again reiterates there is no reason to tell Portia about the kiss and destroy what she and Curtis are trying to rebuild. She tells him to think about it and thanks him for being a gentleman. She heads out. Back at the pool, Stella tells Curtis how lucky he is because Trina is a remarkable young woman. Spencer returns, having changed the playlist for Trina. He joins Trina at their table when Portia approaches. Portia tells Spencer he got here just in time for the cake, and she wasn't sure he was going to make it. He explains he had to drop Esm off at her new job, and Ace at the daycare. Cortia says for a young man like himself co-parenting is a big challenge. Trina says Spencer is doing a great job and stepping up for his brother. Portia agrees it's admirable, but he should also enjoy his youth while he can. She reminds him that Esm could at some point be charged and go to jail, and all the responsibility of caring for Ace will fall on him. Spencer gets a call and excuses himself, as it could be about Ace. Alone, Trina knows her mother doesn't approve, even if she's not outright saying it. Spencer returns and explains the daycare worker at Esm's job is six, so he has to go get Ace. Trina thanks him for coming and says he earned major points with that gift. Spencer likes her family and isn't going anywhere. As he walks off, Trina mumbles, except to daycare. Meanwhile, Stella tells Curtis they need some candles for his cake. But Curtis says that's for kids, and he has everything he could wish for. Marshall says not exactly. He wants Curtis to focus on his marriage and daughter, so he's moving out. Curtis tells him that he doesn't need to do that, but Stella agrees with Marshall's decision. Portia heads back to the restaurant and vents to Zeke about Spencer. She believes Spencer cares about Trina but he can't give Trina the attention she deserves when his focus is split between her and his brother. Zeke says Trina is sharp, and both she and Trina deserve better. Portia is shocked and asks them not to blame Curtis for how he acted on their wedding night. Zeke blurts out, My issue with Curtis is how he's behaved since then. On the terrace, Drew tells Carly only one of them has to go down for this. Carly assumes that means her as it was her mistake. Drew won't let her go to prison as she is the heart and center of her family. He says he's going to offer himself up and plead guilty. She won't allow that and points out that he has a family too. He knows Scout has Sam and Dante, but as she goes away, Donna goes to Sunny, Carly adds, and Nana. She still refuses to let him do this as she can't stand the thought of losing him. They embrace. Zeke discovers Jordan's connection to Curtis and Portia. Plus, Carly refuses to let Drew sacrifice himself for her. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before starting the video, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button 
and give this video a thumbs up. At the Metro Court Pool, Spencer arrives at Curtis' party and brings a gift. Curtis gives him a look but accepts the gift. It's a limited edition portrait of the original Savoy in Harlem, signed by the artist. Marshall and Trina gush over it. Spencer says it's a thank you for saving him and his brother in Greenland. Curtis says no thanks necessary as he helped out with Trina. Trinan and Spencer go to sit at a table, and she tells him that his gift was thoughtful. She has a request for him and asks if he can switch the pool's boring playlist. In the restaurant, Korshia asks Zeke how Marcus seemed and who was with him. Jordan steps off the elevator, and Zeke tells his sister that Jordan was with Marcus. Korshia is surprised he knows Jordan. Jordan walks over, and Zeke says he was telling Portia that he saw her with Marcus earlier. Jordan explains he was a bit unwell, but it's nothing to worry about. Portia thanks her for taking care of him and then asks how they know each other. Zeke says he met Jordan at the pool the other night when his sister stood him up for dinner. Spencer interrupts briefly on his music-changing mission, says hello to the trio, and says he'll see them outside. He leaves and Portia fumes that of course Trina invited Spencer to the party. Jordan asks, party? Portia says Stella organizes a get-together for Curtis' birthday, and she's welcome to join them. Portia excuses herself, and Zeke asks Jordan if she has something to tell him. She says she's the police commissioner, which is how she knows Portia. He is more interested in her last name. She admits she's Curtis' ex-wife. Zeke puts it all together, and Jordan tells Zeke that Portia doesn't need to know about the kiss between her and Curtis, as that is over and done with. Zeke notes Jordan didn't seem surprised by who he was. She admits she found out he was Portia's brother last night when she saw him with her, and that's why she wanted to talk today. She realizes this is too messy to continue to become more than it was, and again reiterates there is no reason to tell Portia about the kiss and destroy what she and Curtis are trying to rebuild. She tells him to think about it and thanks him for being a gentleman. She heads out. Back at the pool, Stella tells Curtis how lucky he is because Trina is a remarkable young woman. Spencer returns, having changed the playlist for Trina. He joins Trina at their table when Portia approaches. Portia tells Spencer he got here just in time for the cake, and she wasn't sure he was going to make it. He explains he had to drop Esm off at her new job, and Ace at the daycare. Cortia says for a young man like himself co-parenting is a big challenge. Trina says Spencer is doing a great job and stepping up for his brother. Portia agrees it's admirable, but he should also enjoy his youth while he can. She reminds him that Esm could at some point be charged and go to jail, and all the responsibility of caring for Ace will fall on him. Spencer gets a call and excuses himself, as it could be about Ace. Alone, Trina knows her mother doesn't approve, even if she's not outright saying it. Spencer returns and explains the daycare worker at Esm's job is six, so he has to go get Ace. Trina thanks him for coming and says he earned major points with that gift. Spencer likes her family and isn't going anywhere. As he walks off, Trina mumbles, except to daycare. Meanwhile, Stella tells Curtis they need some candles for his cake. But Curtis says that's for kids, and he has everything he could wish for. Marshall says not exactly. He wants Curtis to focus on his marriage and daughter, so he's moving out. Curtis tells him that he doesn't need to do that. But Stella agrees with Marshall's decision. Portia heads back to the restaurant and vents to Zeke about Spencer. She believes Spencer cares about Trina but he can't give Trina the attention she deserves when his focus is split between her and his brother. Zeke says Trina is sharp, and both she and Trina deserve better. Portia is shocked and asks him not to blame Curtis for how he acted on their wedding night. Zeke blurts out, My issue with Curtis is how he's behaved since then. On the terrace, Drew tells Carly only one of them has to go down for this. Carly assumes that means her as it was her mistake. Drew won't let her go to prison as she is the heart and center of her family. He says he's going to offer himself up and plead guilty. She won't allow that and points out that he has a family too. He knows Scout has Sam and Dante, 
But as she goes away, Donna goes to Sonny, Carly adds, and Nana. She still refuses to let him do this, as she can't stand the thought of losing him. They embrace.